Hey, it's Ross from RossLukeman.com. Today I want to talk to you about the top 10 van power system mistakes that I've seen. These are mistakes that I've made. These are mistakes that my students have made. And these are problems that I've seen on vans that I've had to fix. And uh, this is what I would tell you if you're going to do a new van conversion and you said, Ross, you know, what are the things that I need to look out for? These are the top 10 and some of the most important things that you want to watch out for. I've got my little list here and I've got a few items here to kind of prove my points. Now, the number one point is using too many household appliances. And uh, the biggest instance of this is using a little mini fridge that runs on 120 volt alternating current here in North America. So let's say you go to Best Buy, you get a mini fridge that's made for a home or an office. That fridge needs to have power 24 hours a day in case the compressor turns on. And that means your inverter has to be on 24 hours a day. Even if it's in the middle of the night, the fridge is off, that inverter has got to stay on in case that refrigerator decides to turn on and uh, cool itself down. And so you basically are going to wear out your inverter. And then if you're on battery power, which if you're running your inverter, you will be on battery power. Um, basically you're going to drain your batteries that much faster. So it's tempting to get the mini fridge or the household appliances that are readily available. Um, but what I recommend is that you go with 12 volt appliances. And essentially what that means is they're going to run directly off the batteries with no conversion. So you're not going to have to have a converter or inverter to raise or lower that voltage. It's just straight off the batteries. And, uh, my advice is to get, everything you possibly can running on 12 volts and running straight off the batteries. That's going to make your system as efficient as possible. So that's going to reduce the amount of batteries that you need, and it's going to reduce the wear and tear on your inverter. And uh, when you go to bed at night, hopefully you can just turn the inverter off. It's going to extend its lifespan and save battery power. So go 12 volt wherever you can. Number two is going to be, uh, the number two mistake is no dimmers on your lights. I made this in my very first van conversion. I had this mistake. Oftentimes in the early morning or the late night, you just need a little bit of light, especially, especially if it's pitch black, dark outside. You don't need to have your uh, lights be either off or fully on. And uh, it's something simple that is overlooked sometimes, but I would recommend using those uh, dimmers and they're going to be 12 volt dimmers. All your lights should be 12 volt uh, going back to point number one. So use those dimmers. And uh, I use this little dimmer from uh, PCA electronics. They have uh, silver, they have black, and they also have gold and uh, it's a high quality 12 volt dimmer. And number three, not fully heating or cooling your van. So I'm tying this into electrical, even though heating is often going to be running on some type of fuel. Um, it's still going to be tied into the electrical system. A lot of people underheat or undercool their van to save money. And the biggest problem I found this, I definitely made this mistake. You're not really going to sleep as well. And uh, you have to look at coming from a house or apartment, you have good heating and cooling with a the thermostat and that is going to help you sleep very well. What you'll find out there is in the winter time, if you get really cold uh, or the summertime, you get very hot. And I traveled around for two and a half years in a van. And uh, what I found was you're not going to sleep well. So investing in an air conditioner, if you need it, investing in a good heating system. Obviously those are both going to tie into your electrical system, but heating and cooling is critical for comfort and uh, you're going to be pretty grouchy out there if you're not sleeping well and it could cut into the fun of van life. So you want to invest in heating and cooling. Number four mistake is no shore power. I think a lot of people imagine van life. They just want to hit the road, cruise the highway. Uh, maybe you picture the sun is always going to be shining on your solar panel or the engine's going to be on. You're going to want to stop eventually and shore power is going to allow you to park under a tree with the engine off and still get some kind of uh, power at a campground. And then also if you're storing the van, you're not even using it. Oftentimes um, people want to plug in to charge the batteries, or you may just want to plug in and charge the batteries up before you depart from your home base. So for various reasons, even if you use it just once a month, you want to have a way to plug in with shore power. 
And uh, if you're doing a brand new build, I recommend an inverter charger. And if your build is already existing, uh, you would use a transfer switch. If you don't want to rebuild the whole power system, you would add a transfer switch. I've got videos on one says uh, shore power for vans and the other one is how to add shore power to an existing system. So I've got videos on both of those if you want to check them out in the, uh, on my channel here. Number five mistake is using a relay instead of a charger for alternator charging. So I have one of my old relays here and uh, I've gone over this in previous videos. The relays are tried and true. A lot of people swear by them, but with the lithium batteries that a lot of people are using, the smart alternators, the relays, they protect your engine battery from going flat and leaving you stranded, but they're not going to regulate the current going through them, which is the volume of electricity, and they're not going to regulate the voltage, which is really the pressure of the electricity. They're not going to regulate any of that from your alternator and engine battery going back to your rear system. And so this can overload your alternator. It can overload the cable between your alternator and your engine battery. A lot of that stuff is specced out at the factory and if you put a huge load on it in the back with the big battery bank in the back, um, some of that stuff is not built to carry that amount of current. And so it's really good instead of using one of these relays, I like to use a DC to DC charger, either the Orion from Victron, Renogy makes some good models as well, and uh, Sterling Power also has some good chargers as well. So. Using the charger is going to regulate the voltage, regulate the current, instead of just letting you run willy-nilly, whatever power gets to the back, gets to the back. And um, that can, as I said, overload your factory alternator engine battery. And it can also uh, be bad for your rear batteries. So will the relay work? Probably, but it would be better to have a charger. So that's mistake number five. Now, I mentioned shore power and alternator power. If you want help with your overall power system, you're putting in a brand new system, you may be interested in my Ultimate Van Power Cheat Sheet. It's a PDF download that I have that discusses the three major charging sources, solar, shore, and alternator power. And uh, it talks about how they all have strengths, but they also have weaknesses. But when you bring them together, in a holistic power strategy. It's gonna make sure that you have a good charge no matter where you go out on the road so you can enjoy your trip out there and not worry about running out of power. There's also a discussion on different battery chemistries and that's gonna help you narrow in on which battery type is right for your situation. And then lastly, there is a really neat conceptual diagram that's gonna show essentially your whole power system on one page. It's gonna show the three major, major charging sources at the top and how they come together, play nice together, charge your batteries, and then how that power gets distributed to your end devices, such as your microwave or your phone charger. So it's a really illuminating diagram. If you want your own copy of the Ultimate Van Power Cheat Sheet, all you have to do is click that link below or go to rosslukeman.com slash vanpower. So with that, let's move on to mistake number six. This is kind of obscure, but uh, it's something that uh, you probably, you may overlook. It's no convenient switch for the water heater. So here is a picture of the Bosch water heater that I like to use. And oftentimes that's under the cabinet or it's in the garage of the van. It's not in a convenient location. And then the on off dial, you're gonna dial it to the temperature that you like. And you really wanna be able to leave that alone. And so what I do is I will run an outlet, I'll have an outlet on the wall just for the water heater and it'll go to its own separate breaker. And then that outlet will be wired to a switch in a convenient location, which is usually right under the sink inside the cabinet. I'll open the cabinet and turn on that switch and it's gonna turn on the water heater at the back of the vehicle back in the garage where I can't get to it. So this is something that uh, is a good technique for a water heater or any other appliance that's kind of hidden that you can't really get in there, um, go ahead and put a, a kill switch essentially in a convenient location so you can turn that outlet on or that appliance on 10 or 12 feet away. So that is uh, something that I've added to vans in the last couple of years that adds a little bit of convenience. Mistake number seven is uh, using electric heaters. So uh, again, this is a common household appliance that 
You may have one in your office. You've got a little heater on your feet. It's great. Uh, you may have an all electric house or apartment and uh, you've got electric heat and it does a great job. Essentially, in an off-grid van, electric heaters are pretty much out of the question. They, unless you're plugged in, which if you're gonna have a van, you don't wanna have to be plugged in all winter. You wanna be able to roam around. Essentially, electric heaters, I ballpark them at 1500 watts. That is about 120 amps coming out of your 12 volt batteries. So that's 120 amp hours per hour. Um, so if you run that electric heater overnight, even if it cuts on and off, it's just going to consume so much of your battery power, it's gonna run your batteries flat overnight and uh, it's just the wrong appliance. What I would recommend is, my favorite are the diesel or gasoline heaters from S-Bar and Webasto. Um, the S-Bar B4 is for gasoline or petrol and the S-Bar D2 is for diesel. So the D is for diesel. The B is benzene, the German word for uh, gasoline. Uh, but those heaters are gonna take just a little bit of electricity. They're gonna take about 30 watts once they ignite the fuel inside. And uh, they're gonna be able to run all night with taking just minimal power from your batteries. And it's really the proper off-grid solution so you don't have to be plugged in at a campground all the time. So again, electric heaters are out of the question. And I would mention, uh, I did have a, a little propane heater the uh, Mr. Heater Buddy, which I've noticed a lot of people use, I used to use in my van. I don't really recommend those either because they're gonna put out carbon monoxide into your space. And uh, here's a picture of me in Seattle in 2016. It actually snowed and uh, it was pretty goofy because I had the roof vent fan open with my uh, Mr. Buddy heater running or Mr. Heater running and uh, you're trying to sleep and you've got to get the carbon monoxide out but you're also sending the heat right out of the roof so it's just kind of a circus and uh, i would recommend and this also ties back in to mistake number three not heating or cooling properly you want to invest in that heater that's not going to uh, draw down your batteries too much you're going to be able to run it all night and you're not going to have to be plugged in all the time and that's going to be running off of some type of fuel so it could be a propex that runs on a propane tank the main difference between that and the little propane heater is the propex is going to exhaust outside the vehicle so the s bars the webastos the propexes that are going to run on some type of fossil fuel they're going to send that combustion air outside the vehicle so you are not uh, asphyxiated while you're sleeping <laughs> Very important for that one. Mistake number eight is uh, no locking hardware on your main electrical system cables. So I've got an example here of uh, good locking hardware. These little nuts on this bus bar are knurled on the back. So when you tighten them down, they're gonna lock in place. Uh, you could also have lock washers or you could have uh, nylock nuts, nylon locking nuts. Let me share a uh, picture. I had to fly to Atlanta to fix a van and uh, the batteries were mounted underneath the van. The electrical system was flickering on and off and nobody knew why. And it ended up being one bolt where the main electrical, the main negative cable from the power system ran and connected to the batteries. That one bolt did not have a lock washer. And uh, not only was it making the power system die and come back on, uh, intermittently but it was also making that connection get hot all the copper had oxidized some of the plastic had melted um, so we have to remember with these vans they're not stationary electrical systems like you would have in a house they are going down the road and there's a ton of vibration and with electrical connections if they get loose they can get hot and as in this instance the power system can actually die down and you don't know why the power's out so you just need to make sure that every single bolt has some type of um, you know, locking mechanism. Like I said, a lock washer, a nylon locking nut. Uh, thread locker, I've used on electrical connections in the past. I do not use that anymore for conductivity reasons, obviously. I do use a lot of thread locker all over these van conversions, but on the electrical, I would stay away from that and use the lock washer or the nylon locking nut, or if you have a knurled nut uh, from the factory on your components, that'll work as well. But just make sure those nuts don't come loose with all that vibration. 
Mistake number nine is no power system ventilation. There is a lot of power conversion. Uh, voltages are boosted up or down in these systems. Uh, some of the chargers will throttle the current from say your alternator and things get a lot hotter in these systems than they would maybe in a house electrical system. And so you wanna be aware, a lot of people, they're afraid to get electrocuted or they don't want, let's say you have your power system in the garage underneath your bed and you just wanna enclose it so you can throw all your gear in there and it doesn't get on top of the electrical system. I would just say, make sure that you don't enclose your system too much. You can either have some big holes in the enclosure or you can add a uh, fan. I have a video on how to add a 12 volt fan that runs on a little thermostat. So you can check out that video if you want more info on that. Um, but just make sure that you're not crowding all your components in there and then enclosing them to make it look nice uh, because a lot of the components will not actually, they'll actually uh, step down on their output when they get hot. So they'll have a variable output. So if you keep them cool, they're gonna run at maximum capacity. And uh, that's kind of the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, things could catch on fire if you don't let them breathe. So that's just a point that I've seen. And uh, it'll also increase the longevity of your components if you let them properly cool down. So you either wanna do that with passive cooling with holes in the enclosure, or uh, if needed, if it's really tight, you can add a little cooling fan and a little thermostat module uh, that's pretty inexpensive as well. And that brings me to mistake number 10, which is no battery monitor. Uh, this may be a no brainer for you, or it may be a revelation, but basically a battery monitor, the name is not that appealing, but to me, it's a fuel gauge. If you don't have a battery monitor, you don't have a fuel gauge to know how much power is left in your batteries. It's not enough to monitor battery voltage because if the batteries are under load, let's say the air conditioner turns on, the voltage is going to kind of artificially suppress. And then when the air conditioner goes off, the voltage is gonna bounce back up. So it's not the best gauge of what's really left in the batteries. The battery monitor is going to tell you what percentage you have left in your batteries. And then if you forget and leave something on, like maybe your uh, water heater and it's pulling 1500 watts, you can glance at that and say, wow, there's 1500 watts coming out of the batteries right now. I should look around and maybe turn something off. And so the battery monitor is a no brainer. You definitely want to put one in your van. I have the smart shunt here. It's a good little, battery monitor that is going to put out a Bluetooth signal and uh, you'll be able to see all that data on your phone. You can also hardwire it. If you have a Servo GX with a uh, touch screen and overall system monitoring, you can hardwire it to that and uh, get its data to show up on the Servo GX as well. So this is a good unit for most vans. And uh, that is my top 10 mistakes that I've seen on van power systems. I hope that was helpful. Again, if you're doing a new power system and you want some help, you gotta grab a copy of my Ultimate Van Power Cheat Sheet. All you have to do is click that link below or go to rosslukeman.com vanpower. So I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.